The sacrifice of Paul McCartney. Why was he killed? What happened to Paul McCartney? According to the book, The Memoirs of Billy Shears, we are told that Paul McCartney died at 5am on Sunday the 11th of September 1966 and was replaced by a session musician called William Shepherd. William assumed Paul's identity from that point onwards. In fact, Memoirs is William's secret reflections of his life and the true Beatles story. This comes on the back of the so-called Paul is Dead hoax, which, as it turns out, was not a hoax after all. For decades, people have investigated this phenomenon, examining the Beatles' lyrics both forwards and backwards for clues, as well as the cover art and odd comments made by the Beatles and their entourage in interviews and so on. It is not the purpose of this presentation to cover these clues, as there are literally hundreds of them. They are well covered by many other books and videos. They are worthy of several other presentations, which perhaps I will collate another time. Likewise, I am not going to examine the well-documented physical evidence comparing the biological Paul McCartney to his replacement. That would also constitute a whole different presentation. In this presentation, I'm going to discuss the possible methods for how Paul was killed, followed by why he was killed, and by whom. How was Paul's car crash orchestrated? In memoirs, we are told that a satanic occulted cabal decided to murder Paul by involving him in a car crash. Let's first contemplate how this crash was orchestrated. One clue is found in the title of William's solo album, Chaos and Creation in the Backyard. It is an anagram for, he died in a car crash on a batty conch. Batty is British slang for crazy, but whilst a conch is normally just a blow to the head, it might actually refer to the fruiting body of a polypore. These are a kind of fungi that grow on trees. Whilst most of these mushrooms are edible and even used in traditional medicine, one genus, called a Hapilopilus, causes central nervous system problems. Was Paul drugged with a batty conch, a poisonous mushroom, and was that why he crashed his car? In the forward's lyrics of Glass Onion, we are told that the walrus was Paul. I think this probably has two meanings. Firstly, there is an embedded image of a walrus on the front cover of Sgt Pepper, which is revealed with the use of a mirror alongside the cutout of Diana Dawes. The cover of Sgt Pepper represents Paul's funeral. The concept of this album was mostly Williams, and John Lennon was telling us so when he told us that the walrus, i.e. the Sgt Pepper album, was Paul, or rather, Williams' idea under the guise of Paul. As an album, everything about Sgt Pepper was out of character from the Beatles' previous releases, so its existence should have been a wake-up call to everyone that Paul was dead, but it wasn't. The other meaning of The Walrus Was Paul appears to be an esoteric word game. In late Middle English, the word walrus is actually morse. This came into late Middle English via French. Readers of Chaucer will not be surprised by this. In turn... The French claimed the word from the Slavic languages. Translated into Latin, the language of the dead, the late Middle English morse becomes morse without the e, which means corpse in modern English. From this knowledge, the walrus was Paul becomes Paul was a corpse. In the back masking of the song Getting Better, we can clearly hear the words Ask the walrus that missed the exit along with other lyrics that describe Paul dying and losing his head. Did Paul miss an exit whilst driving? Was he, accidentally, diverted onto an unlit and or unfinished stretch of road which suddenly terminated? Or was he, accidentally, diverted onto a road with an obstacle laying in wait for him? A stinger thrown across the road, perhaps? Did he then slam into another stretcher? A wall, maybe? Or was he simply run off the road by another vehicle? Paul's car crash premonitions. 
We are told on page 365 of Memoirs that Paul and John made a Faustian bargain for the Beatles' success on the 24th of October, 1963. They were almost certainly tricked into it and probably thought it was all a bit of a joke. If they had genuinely thought that one or both of them would actually die as a consequence, I doubt they would have made the deal with the devil. Note the numerology. 365 reduces to 14 and then 5. The number 5 is connected to restlessness and the desire for freedom and knowledge. It is the number of points on the magical pentagram, which may be good or evil depending on its orientation. In the tarot deck, the major arcana card number 5 is the Hierophant. He is a positive educator and advisor when upright, especially for spiritual matters, but indicates disloyal and bad, maybe even evil, advice when reversed. Card number 14 is Temperance. This card indicates balance and positive combinations whilst upright, but disagreements and disputes when reversed. Memoir says that Paul had ongoing dream premonitions about dying in a car crash months before he did. However, the footnote on page 17 tells us that Paul was involved with hypnotic experiments with Dr. Richard Asher. Is this a euphemism for a mind control program? Were his dreams programmed in some way? Note the numerology. 17 reduces to 8. The number 8 represents the principle, as above, so below. Positively, it shows balance, hard work and sound judgement. But negatively, it can turn those qualities into abusive and unscrupulous behaviour. In the tarot deck, major arcana card number 8 is strength. This card indicates patience and compassion when upright, but also injustice when reversed. Card number 17 is the star. Upright, this card indicates hope and inspiration, but shows unexpected hindrances when reversed. The cover story. In case the news of Paul's death ever leaked out to the general public, a cover story was concocted. Various versions of this story involve Paul having an argument with someone at the studio and then storming out into a rainy night. Whilst driving in the rain, he picks up a hitchhiker who turns out to be a runaway female fan called Donna. After realising who has given her a ride, she is overcome with joy and makes so much fuss that she causes him to crash. In some versions of the story, he runs past a stoplight and collides with a truck. I'm not saying that it didn't happen, how could I possibly know? But I've always found this story implausible. Why involve someone else in his premeditated murder? This seems unnecessarily messy, because unless they choose someone without any connections, she would be missed and her absence reported. Her friends and family would look for her. Staging a car crash that only involved Paul would have been easy. Finding someone to accompany him that is completely alone in the world is an extra task that adds layers of needless complication. I think Donna is a character used to symbolise William leaving his old life to become Paul. The I'm a phony car crash sequence. That Paul's death was not an accident is also confirmed on page 367 of Memoirs. It also tells us that Maxwell did the ancient code. More about him later. Note the numerology. 367 reduces to 16 and then 7. Number 7 denotes spiritual wisdom, mysticism and success. In a tarot deck, card number 7 of the major arcana is the chariot. It indicates travel to new places and victory. Reversed, it can mean bad luck and bad news. Paul died in his modern day chariot, his Aston Martin car. Card number 16 is the Tower, which can bring sudden change, downfall or revelation. Most investigators of Paul is Dead, PID, will be familiar with the large set of bizarre videos made and released many years ago by someone calling themselves I Am A Phony. On the I Am A Phony videos, we are repeatedly shown images of a car crash. Clearly this footage is meant to represent Paul's fatal road accident. In this footage, the car drives over a hill and onto a ramp. 
the car somersaults in the air, lands on its roof, bounces again and flies off onto the soft verge. The crash is absolutely horrific. The car is very badly damaged, with parts flying off as it somersaults. In these videos, the car crash is never shown all the way through in one take, so I have made a series of stills in order to show this car crash in chronological order. The car enters the shot. The car climbing the hill. The car flies over the ramp. The car somersaults. The car lands on its roof. The car rolls. The car rebounds and parts start to fly off. The car flips on its back again. More parts fly off. The car bounces up again and on its end. The car starts to bounce along the soft verge. The car finally ends the right way up as it lands on the soft verge. Note the American, not British formatting of the date, 9-11-1966. What is the source of the Imaphony footage? The Imaphony car crash seems to have been taken from Casino Royale and manipulated to look like low quality Super 8 footage. At the top is a still from the car crash scene in the James Bond film Casino Royale. At the bottom is the matching still from the Imaphony videos. And here at the top, another still from the car crash scene in Casino Royale. At the bottom, the matching still from the Imaphony videos. Some questions to ponder. Was this car crash scene written into the Bond film as a sly piece of soft disclosure about Paul's crash? Is that why it was included in the Imaphony videos? Or is its inclusion in those videos just artfully alluding to Paul's crash? Behind the scenes. For the filming of Casino Royale, an 18-inch road ramp was used in conjunction with an air cannon installed behind the seat of the driver in order to stage the crash. At the top, the installing of the 18-inch ramp onto the road in the film set, and at the bottom, the installing of the air cannon into the rear of the Aston Martin DBS. Here at the top, a photo of Williams 1966 Aston Martin DB6 in Greenwood Green. On page 196 of Memoirs, we are told that this is the car that was bought and fixed up to resemble Paul's crashed one. At the bottom, a photo of the 2006 Aston Martin DBS used in the film Casino Royale. Note the numerology. 196 reduces to 16 and then 7. Number 7 denotes spiritual wisdom, mysticism and success. In a tarot deck, card number 7 of the Major Arcana is the chariot. It indicates travel to new places and victory. Reversed, it can mean bad luck and bad news. Paul died in his modern day chariot, his Aston Martin DB6. Card number 16 is the tower, which can bring sudden change, downfall or revelation. The role of Maxwell Knight. MI5 spy master Maxwell Knight is encoded into the text of memoirs on page 15. He is the same Maxwell referred to in the lyrics of Maxwell's Silver Hammer. Bang bang, Maxwell's Silver Hammer came down upon his head. Bang bang, Maxwell's Silver Hammer made sure that he was dead. The implication here is clear. We are being told that an MI5 spy master was involved with the orchestration of a pop star's death, and that after Paul's horrific car crash, Maxwell was the one that made sure that Paul had died. We are even shown the picture of the Vatican Warhammer that Richard Balducci used in his PID research. In his work, he reminds us that the Camelengo certifies the death of a pope by tapping him three times on the head with a silver hammer and calling out his papal name. If after three rounds of this there is no response from the pope, he is declared dead. Since satanic rituals are usually Christian ones reversed or inverted, doing a similar thing to Paul is not really surprising. Note the numerology. 15 sums to 6, which William regards as the number that represents himself. It is the number of home, family and loving service. 
It is also the cosmic parent and the voice of God speaking to his creation on the sixth day. Negatively, it can also mean separations, indecision and bossiness. In the major arcana of a tarot deck, card number six is the lovers. Part of Paul's death cover story has him dying with a female fan that he picks up hitchhiking. Card number 15 of the major arcana is the devil. We are told on page 365 of memoirs that Paul had made a deal with the devil for the Beatles' success on the 24th of October, 1963. The Crow's Connection to the Beatles In 1966, Maxwell Knight was 66 years old and suffered from heart problems. He died two years later from a heart attack. In his biography, M. Maxwell Knight, MI5's Greatest Spymaster by Henry Hemming, we are told that over the length of his career, he rarely did wet work. So who actually hit Paul over the head with the hammer? Was it literally Maxwell, or did he have a hired hitman do the deed? In the I'm a Phony videos, we are repeatedly shown images of Reggie Cray's mugshot. Why was he included? What was his connection to the Beatles story? The East London gangsters Reggie and Ronnie Cray had wanted to muscle in and take over the management of the Beatles. It was pointed out to them by the Irish crime lord Arthur Thompson, that their association with the Beatles would destroy their career. Realising that this was true, the Cray twins decided to blackmail Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager, for cash. Brian Epstein, along with David Jacobs, the Beatles lawyer, were well known in the 1960s London gay and drug scene, at a time when both were illegal. The Crays rented out working-class rent boys to high-class clientele. They also ran illegal casinos, pushed drugs and operated a hitman service. Brian Epstein and David Jacobs were known to play at the Cray's casinos. They probably used their sex and drug-related services too. On the 9th of March 1966, small-time gangster George Connell called Ronnie Cray a fat puff. Ronnie killed him in retaliation at the Blind Beggar Pub in Bethnal Green, East London, by shooting him in the head in front of everyone there. After his release from jail in 1999, Bradley Allardyce, a former cellmate of Reggie Cray, spoke to BBC Radio 4's Today programme. He said that Reggie made some confessions to him in jail. In one of them, Reggie revealed that the crime that haunted him the most was the death of his first wife, Frances Shea. Motivated by his jealousy of Reggie's attraction to her, Ronnie had forced Frances to take an overdose to make her death appear to be a suicide. Ronnie then confessed to Reggie what he had done two days later. Brian Epstein was found dead from incautious self-overdose of carbrittle, washed down with alcohol, on the 27th of August 1967 at his Chapel Street home. He was found surrounded by half-finished to-do lists, writings, a plate of his favourite biscuits and no suicide note. It appeared that he was in the middle of things when he died. He had apparently attempted suicide in the autumn of 1966, around the time that Paul McCartney was murdered and when his own father had recently died. Clearly that September of 1966 had been very difficult for him but he lived through that experience and then on for almost another year. The question we have to ask is, did Brian meet with a similar end as Francis Shea? Or was he just so upset by the craze blackmailing him and his management contract with the Beatles running out one month later, in September 1967, that he accidentally killed himself in a haze of alcohol? Homosexuality was just beginning to be decriminalised at this time, so being blackmailed over his own homosexuality should have been less of a concern. Jack the Hat McVitie was one of the Cray's own gangsters. He was given a contract calling to carry out, but he refused to do the job. On the 29th of October 1967, the Cray's punished him by luring him to a party in order to shoot him. The gun didn't fire, so they held him down and stabbed him 50 plus times instead. After the murder of McVitie, the police finally caught up with the Crays and arrested them on the 8th of May 
1968. They were trialed, found guilty, and sentenced on January 1969. They had reached out to the Beatles' lawyer, David Jacobs, to represent them over McVitie's murder, but he refused. True to form, they retaliated by murdering him in such a way that his death looked like a suicide. David Jacobs was found hung from the length of satin, tied to the beams of his garage, at his seaside home in Hove, East Sussex, on the 15th of December, 1968. Actress Susanna Lee reported that on the day that she read in the newspaper that David Jacobs was found dead, she also received an invitation in the post from him, asking her to go to lunch with him the following week. Feeling that this obviously didn't make sense, why would he post an invite to her and then calmly go home and hang himself? She contacted Scotland Yard. She was told by the police that they knew the craze had killed David Jacobs, but that since the craze would be spending the next 30 years in jail anyway, there was no point in pursuing it. In the mid-1990s, Susanna Lee wanted to write about this event in her autobiography, but was told not to because the craze was still alive and they didn't want to face charges for David Jacobs' death. John Lennon's message by photograph. On his deathbed, Reggie Cray confessed that there was one person that he had killed, the name of which he had never disclosed to anyone. Clearly this act haunted him, but the fact that even on his deathbed he still wouldn't say who it was indicates that it had to be someone very significant. Was it Paul? Did he use Maxwell's silver hammer on him? Or was he referring to Brian Epstein? On the left is a photo of John Lennon at his home studio in Weybridge, taken on the 29th of June, 1967. On the wall is a single image, the photograph that David Bailey took of John and Paul as part of an infamous exhibition of his photography, which included portraits of the Cray brothers. Of all the hundreds, maybe thousands, of photos of John and Paul, he chose that one to put on his wall, knowing he was going to be photographed doing so. He could have chosen many happier pictures of Paul, as an act of remembrance, so why choose this one? Was John trying to tell us something? Were the Crays connected to Paul's death? Here we have two examples of David Bailey's photography from his exhibition in 1965. On the left are the Cray brothers, and on the right, Paul and John. Why did they kill Paul? Well, finally we come to why Paul was killed. The black magician Alistair Crowley concocted a Luciferian religion called Thelema. The central ideas of this religion came from a book called The Book of the Law, which was written in 1904. It was dictated to him in Cairo, Egypt, through his wife Rose, from an entity called Iwas. This entity was in fact an Anunnaki in a grey alien body. Alistair Crowley and Maxwell Knight were friends. In fact, Maxwell helped to recruit Alistair Crowley into MI5 during World War II, as all top-level participants of the war were secretly occultists. From the frequent mentions of Alistair Crowley throughout memoirs, we deduce that William is Alistair Crowley's son. Although William appears to have been abandoned as a child, he was eventually chosen by the Dark Cabal to replace Paul. According to Alistair Crowley in his book, The Equinox of the Gods, certain vast stars or aggregates of experience may be described as gods. One of these is in charge of the destinies of this planet for periods of 2,000 years. The god Horus rules the present period of 2,000 years, beginning in 1904. Everywhere his government is taking root. Observe for yourself the decay of the sense of sin, the growth of innocence and irresponsibility. In his diaries, Alistair Crowley also tells us that the Eon of Isis ended in 500 BC, which is when the Eon of Osiris began. This in turn ended when the Eon of Horus began in 1904. The Eon of Horus the conditions of the Eon of Horus are explained on page 162 of Memoirs. They describe how Paul was identified as the reincarnated Osiris. This was partly based on his astrological birth chart on the 18th of June 1942, when the Sun was conjunct Betelgeuse at 26 degrees Gemini, 
and when both were also in exact opposition to the womb of the Milky Way galaxy. Since William is considered to be the reincarnated Horus, his eon would not be fully realised until the reenactment of the Osiris Horus story had taken place. This involves Osiris, Paul, being slain and his soul migrated into the living Horus, which is William. This is why Paul was killed. You can see a picture of Osiris and Horus on the left. Note the numerology. 162 reduces to 9. The positive aspects of number 9 show it to be a humanitarian number. Negatively, it can demonstrate immorality. In the Tarot Dex Major Arcana, card number 9 is the Hermit. He is shown holding the lamp of Hermes, who has been enlightened and is now at the end of his journey. This card indicates introspection, searching, guidance and solitude when upright, but secrecy and failure due to over-careful inactivity when reversed. In Memoirs on page 557, it explains how William will be declared a god of music upon his death. It states that his role as Paul's replacement will be seen as fulfilling Alistair Crowley's prophecies about the Eon of Horus. William, as Paul, will be recognised as the Messiah, with Alistair Crowley as his prophet. It also claims that after a massive depopulation, a generation of literalists will emerge. They will turn against their unbelieving parents to proclaim Paul's divinity. We are told to look at Luke 12, 51-53. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but division. Note the numerology. 557 reduces to 17 and then 8. The number 8 represents the principle, as above, so below. Positively, it shows balance, hard work and sound judgment. But negatively, it can turn those qualities into abusive and unscrupulous behaviour. In the tarot deck, Major Arcana card number 8 is Strength. This card indicates patience and compassion when upright, but also injustice when reversed. Card number 17 is the star. Upright, this card indicates hope and inspiration, but shows unexpected hindrances when reversed. One World Religion According to the Dark Cabal, the Eon of Horus would lead to a new age and a new world order, with a one world religion. In order to establish this new world order, the old one has to be knocked down and replaced with their own fall of Paulism as the one world religion. It will replace the old Christian Paulism relating to Saint Paul. The Lima, extended through this new Paulism, means obeying your own will and not that of the biblical gods. In my opinion, page 557 is probably the most important one in the whole book. It is important to note that the world's previous new world order was the Holy Roman Empire. Its official religion was Christianity, which it adopted after many years of oppressing it. It merged Christianity with the old pagan traditions, which is why, if you go to Vatican City, you'll see it's still full of pagan imagery. In more recent years, the church has been fully infiltrated by Luciferians. Pope the Sixth Audience Hall was completed in 1971 and is literally in the shape of a snake's head, which we see on the left. Negative Alien Agenda Talking about the New World Order without mentioning the negative alien agenda renders the story only half told. This agenda is literally millions of years in the making, so I'll just say this. For tens of thousands of years, various races such as the Alpha Draco and the Anunnaki have been fighting for dominance on Earth. They have posed as gods and installed mind control programs such as violent religions in order to kill and suppress us. Worldwide, they have infiltrated their way into the top of governments and international organisations. With the use of alien technology, such as Looking Glass, Yellow Cube, Stargates and quantum computing-based AI, the Dark Cabal have been predicting the future and then planning accordingly. Soft disclosure of this technology can be found in films like Contact and Stargate. There are a few subtle mentions of the negative alien agenda throughout memoirs, 
For example, the fact that modern mankind are descendants of a hybrid alien slave race produced by the Anunnaki is confirmed on page 450 of Memoirs. On this page we are also told that the Anunnaki known as Enki also formed the Earth's first secret society, the Brotherhood of the Snake. Note the numerology. 450 reduces to 9. The positive aspects of number 9 show it to be a humanitarian number. Negatively, it can demonstrate immorality. In the Tarot Dex Major Arcana, card number 9 is the Hermit. He is shown holding the Lamp of Hermes, who has been enlightened and is now at the end of this journey. Hermes is the Greek equivalent to the Egyptian god or Anunnaki, known as Toth. This card indicates introspection, searching, guidance and solitude when upright, but secrecy and failure due to over-careful inactivity when reversed. Reptilian Alpha Draco rule within the Illuminati is also mentioned on page 588 of Memoirs. Note the numerology. 588 reduces to 21 and then 3. Number 3 is the number of magic, creativity and threefold systems such as the mind, body and spirit or the trinity of the Godhead. Card number 3 of the major arcana is the Empress. Upright, she denotes motherhood, nature and abundance. Reversed, she indicates conflict and inaction. Card number 21 of the major arcana is the world. This card indicates integration and accomplishment when upright, but failure, boredom and being stuck when reversed. The future. According to former US Navy SEAL and whistleblower Bill Wood, after years of tampering with timelines for their own advantage, the Dark Cabal reached a stumbling block. This was shown on the end of the Aztec calendar on the 21st of December 2012, which is referenced on page 128 of Memoirs. This was an important date for the Cabal. It was the point at which their tampering no longer really mattered in the long run. After 2012, all timelines started to converge towards an inevitable event. This event is the Cabal's worst nightmare, an evolution of consciousness also known as the Great Awakening. Once we wake up to the truth, they can no longer trick us or suppress us. The Dark Cabal can't prevent this event from happening, but they can seriously stall for time. This involves throwing out high-level, fear-based programming and killing off as many of us as possible. However, in the end, the raising of consciousness will still happen eventually. And they know it. Of course, the Cabal won't go down without the mother of all fights, which is what we are witnessing right now. The best thing we can do to fight them is to wake up as many people as possible and not give in to negative emotions like fear, which these negative beings feed on. It's just a choice between fear and love. Live and love, folks. <laughs>